Um, <clears throat> before, I forget, before I begin my message this morning, I just want to share something with you that um, I hadn't really thought of until this morning, but it applies to, to all churches at all times, but especially in the summertime. Um, I want to encourage you to not be, to, to not be uh, discouraged by the doldrums. You know what doldrums are? Um, we call them doldrums. We think when we say doldrums in um, American vernacular now, we're talking about somebody who's uh, down about things. But doldrums, I'm telling you this from seventh grade science. I don't, that's the only thing I probably remember from seventh grade science. But doldrums are actually a term that's used for wind patterns near the equator. There you go. That's that's just that's free of charge this morning. Now you know. And so sailors back in the day when they were relied solely on wind power would be um, wary of the doldrums because once you got down there, you would get stuck and it was hot and there was no wind moving and you had no power to move um, your ship. And sometimes in the summer when it's so muggy outside, like this morning it felt like you were walking through a wet blanket if you um, going to and from the, the car and folks are, are busy and on vacation and away at things during the summertime, we could kind of settle in very quickly to this, oh, well, time to just, God must be on vacation too. I guess we should all just relax, not much going on. But I don't want you to miss what God is doing because he's never on vacation. He, he's, he's fine with us going on vacation. He's, he encourages us to rest, but he's never on vacation. And there's always things that he's wanting to do. We have exciting things coming up for sure, but we have exciting things going on with the Lord at all times and this morning. So I know in your bulletin it says to turn to, turn to Matthew 10, but if you're already there, what I want you to do is turn one page back to Matthew chapter 9, because as I was preparing this week, it dawned on me that chapter 10 will make a whole lot more sense if we get a running start towards it. Um, from Matthew chapter 9 where we spent a little bit of time last week and uh, we're going to spend more time there this morning and then next week we will catapult into uh, Matthew chapter 10 and see what God is teaching us there. This is the third part of our series called Heavy Lifting. We did a whole series on bodybuilding, on the Lord building up his church in unity and strength and how he does that and how we're a part of that. And now we're talking about what we do with that strength. And that is we do some heavy lifting. In particular, we're talking about outreach to the lost. And last week we talked about it in terms of uh, what God had helped us do through Vacation Bible School. This week we're going to look at it a little bit further in some different ways. So if you would look at Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 27, we're going to read through verse 38 all the way to the end of that chapter there. Verse 27 picks up, and Jesus is doing his public ministry, and he's, he's healing um, people and, and raising people from the dead and things just incredible things like that. We're going to pick up with this story here, though, where it says, When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind man came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man, mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. <clears throat> but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. 
Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. What we're going to uh, see this morning are two ways that Jesus shows us how to share God with others. Two ways that he shows us how to share God with others. As we get ready to do that, I know that in my experience as a Christian, whenever I hear it, it's gotten less this way over the years, but whenever I used to hear somebody say something about sharing God with others, I immediately got a little bit tense because it's like, oh boy, that's scary. And I'm not sure I can do it. And I feel like I, if I don't do it, then I'm, then I'm failing miserably. It's just a lot of, a lot of tension involved with that, that idea. But I'm going to tell you something that I hope will encourage you. And it comes with this, with a story of something I saw while sitting in a doctor's office years ago. And there was an infomercial on the television there. You don't know what infomercials are, right? You've, you've seen these things. It's like a, a whole television program dedicated to selling one particular thing like OxyClean or um, ShamWiles or uh, what, what have you. This one, though, was about something called the breakfast machine. The breakfast machine. It was a machine about the size of a microwave, so it would have stood, you know, right here in the space where I'm standing. Um, and on the bottom part of it, it had a coffee pot, which is the most essential thing for breakfast, as far as I'm concerned. It had a coffee pot. On the side, it had a toaster. And on top... It had a hot plate, basically, where you could fry eggs and bacon. It was the breakfast machine. So if you're in a dorm room, not that you would be allowed to do this because somebody would, you know, freak out that you were, you know, actually cooking food. Um, but uh, if you were in a dorm room or a small apartment, this would be ideal. You would have an all-in-one cooking device, and if you're creative enough... It wouldn't just be a breakfast, breakfast machine. It could be a every meal machine. You, you know, you could make soup in the coffee maker. I, I'll explain that later. I didn't understand it until somebody explained it to me. But you can make soup in the coffee maker. And, you know, toast is always good. And you can cook anything on a hot plate. And the whole thing behind this was is that it was an all-in-one breakfast machine. And I think sometimes when we hear God say things to us, like, I want you to share the good news that you have believed with others, where we think that we have to somehow just magically, if nothing else, be an all-in-one Christian. That we have to be able to do everything on our own that Scripture says to do. And what happens when we think that way is that when we realize we can't do that, then we think that, well, uh, when I, that I can't do everything perfectly on my own. Then we start thinking, well, then it must be up to the ones who, who are in this for um, the long haul, who are in this professionally, who are, are ministers or who are um, celebrity Christians um, or what we might call super Christians. But God's plan for reaching the world with his good news is not to make super Christians, just a few of them. His plan is to make all of us Christians equipped to do all that he wants us to do together, together. Therefore, rather than us being all in one, in other words, you know, just absolutely having all the spiritual gifts and everything else. God wants us to work together using the gifts that we have individually combined to share him. If you remember back when we were in Ephesians chapter 4, the key verse, one of the key verses there was that said that Jesus gave some to be apostles, prophets. Let me just start that again. Jesus gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors so that all can be equipped for 
the work of ministry. In other words, God wants us all involved. We might not have the same gifts or we might not have the same uh, abilities, but together we can be the body of Christ. And that's what the bodybuilding series was all about. Now we have to ask the question, what does it look like once we have built that body and we start working together to do what God says? And I think that the best answer to that is that you and I individually and all of us together as a whole need need to follow the example that Jesus set for us. What does that look like? We get a pretty good idea even just from the passage that we are looking at here. So the two ways that Jesus shows us how to share God with others are, first of all, this. Jesus helps us what I'm going to call this morning, provide proof of life, proof of life, in this case, eternal life. I don't know if you all heard on the news this week, but uh, we did a prisoner exchange apparently with, with Russia. We gave them somebody that we had of theirs and they gave us back a Wall Street Journal um, journalist that they had been holding for over a year. And whenever that happens, uh, when, when there's a, either a hostage situation or a prisoner swap going on, either side re- will require something called proof of life because they don't want to be giving a ransom or trading someone for, for someone who's not actually alive. So they ask for things that are going to prove that person is alive, like video conference with them or their voice on the telephone or... Um, you know, what have you. It could be the an EKG that's actually going on to prove that their heart is beating, what have you. And in a similar way, what Jesus does and what he wants us to do is to prove who he is and that we're alive in him by the things that we do in his name. He does it in a fascinating way. Jesus heals those who are blind. He heals those who are mute and possibly deaf as well because those two symptoms often occur together, contribute to one another. He does that in the passage that we just read. And in doing so, he proves to all all those Jewish citizens that are watching him That he is the Messiah. And why is that? Well, you don't have to turn there, but if you want to just write down Isaiah chapter 35. When the prophets of the Old Testament were giving prophecies about the Messiah, the deliverer that would come to Israel, whom Jesus is. They said they made certain predictions, like specific predictions about the kind of person the Messiah was going to be and the kind of things that he was going to do. In Isaiah chapter 35, they make two or three of those predictions. Isaiah does. Starting in verse 3 in Isaiah chapter 35, God's word says this. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. All this is talking about the Messiah. And then it goes on to say this in verse 5. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Now let me go back to Matthew 9 and remind you of exactly what happens in this passage. It says, When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saving, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, The blind men came to him and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. 
Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. Now, what did Isaiah say was going to happen when the Messiah came? The eyes of the blind will be opened. When Jesus touches them and they, they believe in him and he touches them, their eyes were opened. Verse 31 in Matthew 9. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. And as they went out, behold, they brought to him a man mute and demon possessed. He was mute uh, and or deaf. Sometimes that word used for mute community was communicated either one or the other of those or both. Because oftentimes folks that are deaf are mute um, uh, or, or just mute. And the guy's word goes on to say, when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. Isaiah 35 said, The eyes of the blind will be open, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shall shout for joy. Jesus unstops the deaf ears of the two deaf men. He cast out the demon that was causing the, the mute man to be mute, and he's able to talk. He did these things, I believe, for two reasons, at least two reasons, possibly more. One, because he cared about them and he had compassion upon them and he, and he wanted to help them. But two, so that he could prove by his life that he really is the Messiah. That he is God who came to save you and me and them and the world around us who will believe in him. He did that to prove that. Now, those actions validated his claims of who he was and who he is. For us to follow that example will look a little bit different, but will have a similar purpose. For us, it's a matter of learning to live in such dependence upon Jesus and in surrender to him that his character and strength and the transforming power of his spirit can be seen in us. So that, that can prove that you and I have new and eternal life with him. It's proof of life in that way. Earlier in the book of Matthew, uh, Jesus said it this way. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And give, it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. One time Lisa and I were on a mission trip. This is before we were married, before she even realized what she had um, and, uh, or, was, or could have. And, um, and we were on a mission trip and it was a very, uh, challenging week I'll, that I'll share more of with you at some point. But one of the pastors that was hosting us at their church, uh, he was a youth pastor, high school youth pastor, um, and his message to the kids for the week that also spoke to us was simply this. The best evidence of a changed life is a what? Is a changed life. The best evidence of a changed life is a changed life. In other words, the best evidence uh, that you believe in Jesus and he is changing your life is that your life is being changed. And people can look at it and see a difference in you than either they saw before you knew Jesus or that they see an increasing likeness about you 
of Jesus or they simply see something different in you than they see in the rest of the world because it's like Jesus. And this is not a call to you to start pretending to be more like Jesus. There is enough pretending that goes on in this world. Amen? There's enough pretending. Um, but it is a matter of depending. It's not a matter of pretending. It's a matter of depending upon God to say and saying to him, Lord, please make me more like you. Please change my life to be more like the eternal life you've given me and that I will one day enjoy in heaven. Please change me from the inside out because the same power that rose you from the dead, the same spirit that rose you from the dead lives in me for that very purpose. And I believe it. And I'm asking you to help me surrender to it so I can be changed and others may see it. That's something that we need to pray individually, but it's something that we also need to pray as a church. In Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul gave the Colossian church a list of things of what it would look like when they were surrendered to the Lord and being changed by him. This is what he said. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with Compassion. Just pick up on some of these adver- or adjectives and adverbs that it says we ought to be like Christ. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That is probably the best blueprint for what church should be, what we should look like as a church, what we should look like to others outside of the church. But before I preach a whole other sermon on that passage, I just want to remind you that what God is saying there is that this is what he desires and intends to make of us. We need to desire and intend to submit to it and to cooperate with him so he can make that of us. It's a, and again, I'm not going to preach the whole message on this passage, but it's an interesting thing that God says here. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And that verb, clothe yourself, is giving us a description of, of, that I think is somewhat clear, but one that we don't always remember. And that is, if we've got to clothe ourselves with it, it means that we don't already have it. We don't have it on us. We don't have it in us. But we have God in us to transform us and to make it in us and to put us on us and to help us live in it a life that looks like Jesus to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family, to our community, to this world. And in doing so, we provide proof to them that we have eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the second way that Jesus shows us in this passage how to share God with others is this. 
he shows us to seek those who need new life proven to them. Not only does he want us to prove life, but he wants us to go and find those who don't have it, who need it, and who need to see it in us. They need to hear it from us and see it in us. Let me read the end of that of chapter 9 to you again before we move on, just to, to remind us of what Jesus said. It says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, plentiful but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So what Jesus does there, he gives us two ways to, to see the law, see, to see people that don't know him. The first way he tells us is to see them as scattered sheep. I'll tell you a funny story, and I, I'm not making this up. Lisa says she, the stuff that happens to me is just, just weird. It happens to nobody else. But one day, um, I was late leaving church here, and I'd driven myself by myself, and so it was just me in the car. So I don't have any evidence to prove this to, that this happened, but it really did happen. And um, I, th I can't remember why exactly, but anyway, I, I went home the, um, we call it the back way, through, uh, at, uh, into Essex through um, 14, uh, off of 14. And um, one of the roads that I cut through there, I think it's uh, Poor House Road, um, uh, well, there's a little house on there. And um, I was driving down the road, just bebopping along, and I thought I was seeing things because there was a whole flock of sheep in the road right in front of me. And I thought to myself, have I somehow been transported to, I don't know, Turkey or uh, Saudi Arabia? And I'm literally in, in the middle of a sheep herd in my car. But it wasn't. And there was, I saw the little house there, and I saw that they had some, some fencing um, and I pulled in, and I went to the door to tell them that their sheep were in the road. Um, they did not speak English except for the, the youngest daughter, and so it was very interesting. I was trying to remember my you know, high school Spanish, trying to communicate. I had no idea what the word for sheep is, still don't. I don't and, uh, so, but I'm, I'm like I'm doing like this, bah, bah, road, road. And they were like, oh, thank you. And I was like, oh, this is not working. And sheep just wandering around there. And I, I was afraid, you know, people fly down those back roads. I was afraid someone was going to come through and there was just going to be, um, you know, be a lot of uh, bat and wool everywhere, if you know what I mean. So, um, or uh, mutton and, um, <clears throat> and sweater material. Uh, so just all over Poor House Road. Um, and so... It finally, by about the time I was leaving, somebody came out, and the sheep were starting to make their way back back over. And you know, of course, stuff like that comes to mind when you when you hear Jesus talking about people looking like sheep that are scattered. What the world looks like to Jesus is this: we are wandering around in the road, about to get run over, and we have no idea. Those sheep couldn't have cared less that I was there. I was in their road; they weren't in my road. And that's how, the, that's how, as human beings, we treat the world. This is my planet. You know, you religious folks are getting in my way. And that's the way people thought back then as well. That way, and also another way, they, there were those who just had no idea what, what was about to befall them. Um, in the judgment of God, still living, we still live in a world. Where people have no idea what is going to befall them one day when they stand before Jesus. And then there are those who do have some sense of that. They have a sense that God is good and they are not, and they want to be good in God's eyes. 
they're scattered in the sense that they, we live in a world that gives you a million mixed messages of how to be right. You hear th- statements today like, on, on the news and whatnot, like taking control of the truth or taking control of the narrative or determining what is true. And if you want to be honest, if you don't know, if you don't have a foundation in some truth that came from God's word, you are, you are at best a scattered sheep. You're at best a scattered sheep. There's no way for you to figure out or to stumble upon or to have a TikTok video or a a YouTube tutorial on how to know God that's not going to conflict with some other Instagram post or Google search that says this is the no, 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 this is how you need to know God. Or one that simply says you don't need to know God at all. Because that's what a lot of people believe now. So, Jesus looks at folks that are scattered and and like those sheep I was witnessing about to be splattered sheep. And he has compassion on them because they are in grave danger. And he looks at those who have some concept of the fact that they need God and can't find him in this world. And he has compassion on them because they are led astray by so many different things that claim to be truth. That's the first way that Jesus sees the lost and also wants you and I to see them as well. The second way is this. He sees them as ripe grain. In other words, hearts that were desperately ready for the Messiah. He says the harvest is ready, plenty, abundant. It's ready. And they were ready because they had hearts who were desperate for the Messiah. They believed what the Old Testament said about Jesus. They were waiting for him. They are desperate for him because of the the religious misdirection they were being given by the Pharisees. And they were ready for him because of the, the political oppression they were experiencing from the Romans. They were ready for Jesus. Spiritually and politically and physically and every other way. They were ready and waiting. And Jesus' thought about them is, as our thought is about grain in the end of this month, is we got to get them in before it's too late. We've got to gather them in before it's too late. We've got to shepherd the sheep, gather the harvest. And of course, what he's talking about there are people. And any of those things I just described, of course, Jesus was looking at people in in Galilee and Jerusalem, but we could find those kind of people, all those kinds of people, in King and Queen, or in the Middle Peninsula, or in Virginia, or in America, who are who feel overwhelmed by uh, you name it taxation in the government or the high cost of things in the or the fact that you can't get truth anywhere because there's a million things that, that oppose each other that are claiming to be the truth and so Jesus tells them tells the disciples there that This is how I want you to see people. And he's telling us the same thing. I want you to see people as scattered sheep who need leadership to their shepherd. Need you to lead them. Need us to lead them to their shepherd, Jesus Christ. And grain that that needs to be harvested by 
his workers before it's too late. And we're running out of time here, but I, I wanted to share with you quickly, and then we're going to get into some, I'm going to leave some strategies for us particular to do this for next week. But I wanted to give you um, these two things, and then we'll be done. I believe there's two responses that the disciples uh, and you and I can have when we hear Jesus saying, pray the Lord of harvest to send forth har harvesters, workers for his harvest. I think there's four man-centered responses and one God-centered response. The man-centered responses, in other words, the ones that are selfish and self-centered, sound like this. Well, isn't it their fault that they're weary and scattered in the first place? I didn't put them in that position. If they, you know, why should I feel sorry for them? They made their choices. That's number one. That would be, that would be man-centered way for us to respond. Second is this. Why is Jesus telling us to pray for workers and not sending us? We're the ones that have been following him. These are the disciples now and could be us. Who else does he have in mind? Who else is going to get this glory? Thirdly, what good is it going to do for us to pray? Why is he telling us to pray to God the Father to send workers? What good is that going to do? Is that really going to work? And fourthly, shoo, all we have to do is pray, guys. We don't really have to do anything ourselves. All those things are normal, natural human responses when Jesus says, sheep are scattered, the harvest is ready, pray for laborers to gather in the harvest, direct the sheep with the truth. But what I think would be a really good God response would be this. And it's simply a prayer that I wrote out in response to this. So if you would, we'll close with this. If you would, just close your eyes and we're gonna, I'm gonna pray this out loud and you can pray it in your heart with me as I, I do so. This is a God-centered response to Jesus' call for us to recognize weary and scattered sheep, harvest that's ripe, to pray for workers and to be them. Lord Jesus, thank you for seeking me out when I was weary and lost. Thank you for doing that now when I feel weary and lost sometimes still. I'm surrounded by a world of people who are weary and scattered and I ask that you would send harvester, harvesters to reach them with your offer of salvation and redemption. Jesus, I pray that you would begin with me. In whatever manner you desire, in whatever way I can be useful to you and your mission and your kingdom, please, Lord Jesus, begin with me. Amen. I hope that that prayer reflects the desire of your heart as well. Uh, in fact, what I think I'm going to do is I'll, I'll email this prayer to you so that we can pray it together uh, this week. We will pray it together this Wednesday uh, when we're gathered together um, for prayer meeting, but also so that you can uh, pray it along with us whenever and, and as often as you'd like. Right now we're going to um, remember 